Welcome to Learning Chinese Provinces, Part 3. This is the third in a three-part series of videos. In Part 1, we focused on 12 administrative areas in the heartland of China. Most were north-south or east-west pairs, based on the words for river, mountain, lake, or another geographic feature. Part 2 added 11 more areas, many named for specific rivers or lakes. In Part 3, we will learn the remaining 11 administrative areas. The names of most of these are linked to history rather than geographic features. Sometimes, history ends up involving memorization rather than logic. But fortunately, you may already know some of these place names. Relax, and don't get too overwhelmed with the history behind the names. You don't need to remember the details or the dates. Listen to the stories, but focus on remembering the province names. In addition to use of standard Mandarin Chinese, significant segments of the population use localized dialects of Chinese. Also, China's population includes 56 ethnic groups, many with their own distinctive language. Both of these linguistic characteristics of China, as well as the legacy of Western colonial influence, will come into play as we learn the names of more provinces. In Part 1, we learned that the names of Chinese provinces used in modern English language books and as shown on tourist maps are based on the pinyin romanization of their Chinese names. Remember that our versions of these names do not include the tone marks used in pinyin. There are four exceptions to this general rule, four cases where we use a different name than the Chinese do. Two of these are autonomous areas, and two are special administrative regions on the south coast of China. Let's start with those. Let's zoom in on the estuary of the Pearl River. This is where water from Guangdong province drains into the South China Sea. Here we find two former colonies of Western empires. The Chinese name of this special administrative region is written like this. Literally, it means fragrant port. Look at the second character, which means port. Do you see the water radical that we learned in part two? In standard Mandarin, the name is pronounced Xiangang. So we would normally expect to see it on the map as Xiangang. Many people in southern China speak the Cantonese dialect and pronounce this same name as Hong Kong. However, you will find neither of these names in English language publications or on tourist maps. Instead, you will see Hong Kong, the name under which the British ruled the area for 150 years. I am sure you already know the name, Hong Kong. The name is a British altered version of the Cantonese pronunciation. The English spelling conforms to that version. To communicate with other English speakers, don't worry about remembering the Chinese name. Just remember Hong Kong. Across the bay is a tiny administrative area that used to be a Portuguese colony. This is another special administrative region. Its Chinese name is written like this and pronounced Aumen. The first character means bay or inlet of the sea and the second means gateway or outlet. Do you see the water radical in the character for bay? The name of the colony was Macau, and that name is still used in English language publications and maps. Historians are not certain about the source of the name, but there are theories. Here is one. Ma Zu is a sea goddess. There is a temple dedicated to Mazu near the bay, and so some say the name Macau was derived from the name Ma Gang, which means Mazu harbor. Don't worry about the story. Just remember Macau as the name of this special administrative region. You have probably heard of Tibet. 
It is sometimes called the roof of the world because it is at a very high elevation. Look at this map, which shows the varied elevations across this part of Asia. Do you see that huge mountainous area in southwest China? Tibet is there. The highest mountain in the world, which we call Mount Everest, is on the southern border of Tibet. The Chinese name for the region is Xizang. The name we use, Tibet, has no relation to the Chinese name, nor to Tibetan language names for the area. Some say that the name Tibet had its roots in a Turkic term meaning the heights. To communicate with other English speakers, just remember Tibet. We now shift our attention further north. You may have heard of Chinggis Khan. Born in the 12th century, he united nomadic tribes of North Asia, and at the beginning of the 13th century began the conquest of a huge area, which we refer to as the Mongol Empire. Even after his death, expansion continued and ultimately encompassed 9 million square miles. The Mongol Empire became what is said to have been the largest contiguous land empire in world history. By the time that Chinggis Khan's grandsons inherited power, internal divisions and strife broke the empire into several pieces. One grandson, Kublai Khan, established the Yuan Dynasty of China, which lasted until 1368, almost 100 years. Today, an autonomous region in northern China bears the name Inner Mongolia. Do not confuse it with the independent nation of Mongolia, once called Outer Mongolia. The Chinese name for this region is Nei Mongu. Here's how the full name of the autonomous region looks in the traditional Mongol script. Our name for the region Inner Mongolia is a straightforward translation of the Chinese name. Remember Inner Mongolia. We are done with the four exceptions. Now we can return to the normal situation where we use the Romanized spelling of Chinese names. The timeline of the history of China with its expanding and contracting borders is complex. Likewise, there is not a single thread that makes up the political history of China. Sometimes it was split into several competing kingdoms or empires, and several times it was conquered from the outside. We will not go into detail, but it is worth mentioning that the Yuan Dynasty, when China was ruled by Mongols, was followed by the Ming Dynasty. Rule passed back to ethnic Han emperors and the Ming Dynasty lasted almost 300 years. In Part 2, we spoke of the area in northeast China, sometimes called Manchuria. In the middle of the 17th century, the army of Manchuria swept south past the Great Wall and into the heartland of China, overthrew the Ming Dynasty, and established the Qing Dynasty, comprised of Manchu emperors. The Manchus had a language distinct from Chinese, with a writing system that closely resembled that of the Mongol language. In our previous video, we learned the names of two of the provinces that comprise Manchuria. Now we will learn the name of the province colored orange on the map to complete the set. The name of this province is Jilin. The literal meaning of these Chinese characters is auspicious forest. However, the naming of the province had nothing to do with good luck or trees. When the Chinese language integrates a foreign word or term, it is often purely phonetic. For example, the American city Denver is rendered with two Chinese characters which mean Red Buddha. Red Buddha? Well, the pronunciation of the two characters is Danfu, which sounds a bit like Denver. The reason has nothing to do with Buddha. So, why? Jilin. In the Manchu language, the name of this area is pronounced as Jirin Ula. 
It means along the river. When this name was adapted and rendered in the Chinese language, the initial part became Jilin, and the second part was dropped. Phonetic, nothing to do with trees. So remember that the middle province in Manchuria takes its name from the Manchu language. Remember Jilin. Moving to the south, we come to a large island off the eastern coast of the mainland. Westerners used to call the island Formosa, a Portuguese name, but the Chinese name is Taiwan. Tai means platform. One is a word for bay or gulf. Do you see the water radical? Literally, the name of this self-governing area means platform bay. Platform bay? Odd. Actually, this is another case of phonetic substitution for a non-Chinese word. Taiwan is derived from Taiwan, the name of a mountain tribe of one of the indigenous peoples who lived on the island. A phonetic transformation took place. First, rendering it as Da Yuan, which later became Taiwan. An interesting side note: in self-governing Taiwan, people still use the older, traditional form of written Chinese. In the People's Republic of China, they use a simplified version. Compare the two forms of the name Taiwan. What do you think? Remember that Taiwan is the name of the island off the east coast of mainland China. Now let's head directly inland to the province that faces Taiwan. The name of this province is derived from two cities of historical importance, Fuzhou and Jianzhou. By combining the first character of each city name, we get Fujian. Remember that Fujian is the name of the province facing Taiwan. Jumping inland, we reach the province indicated in purple. Guizhou received its current name about 800 years ago, and about 600 years ago was formally designated as a province. The character Gui means expensive or precious, and Zhou. We have encountered this character before. Several cities we previously mentioned included the character Zhou, although it is sometimes translated as state or prefecture. The best explanation is that it is a historic word that, in the past, described some sort of administrative division. Today, it remains in various place names. Guizhou is a mountainous province of stunning beauty, sometimes compared to Switzerland. Although its economy is weak, it is the home to numerous ethnic minorities and is rich in culture. So consider the name "precious region" appropriate for Guizhou province. Remember Guizhou. Just north of Guizhou, we reach our next administrative area, Chongqing. Officially designated as one of the four municipalities that are not part of provinces, Chongqing challenges the semantics of that term. This municipality has an area the size of the American state of South Carolina. Chongqing includes a concentrated urban area of five million inhabitants. This urban area straddles the Yangtze River and used to be known in the West as Chongqing. There are numerous additional cities, towns, and villages within Chongqing. This massive municipality was part of Sichuan Province until it was separated in 1997. The name of the city dates back to Zhao Dun, who lived in the 12th century. When his father became the second emperor of the Southern Song Dynasty in 1162, Zhao Dun was named Prince of Gong. In 1171, he became Crown Prince of the Empire. And then, in 1189, he became emperor. 
adopting the throne name Guangzong. To celebrate this string of honors, he named this city Chongqing, which means repeated celebrations. Remember Chongqing, the oversized municipality along the Yangtze River east of Sichuan. Heading north, we come to Ningxia Autonomous Region. The name means pacified Xia. Xia refers to the Western Xia Empire in northwestern China, which lasted from the 11th century through the 13th century. The Western Xia engaged in numerous battles and wars with its neighbors to the east, south, and north. Ultimately, the Western Xia became part of a unified China under the Mongol Yuan Dynasty. Ningxia, the pacified Xia. Ning. Wait a moment. We've encountered that character before. Let's take a moment and revisit the location and name of Liaoning Province. In part two of this video series, we geographically associated the Liao River shown on the map with the name of Liaoning Province. But there is also a historical significance to the name. The river shared its name with the Liao Empire. This flourished in northeastern China and parts of Mongolia at almost the same time the Western Xia Empire existed in the northwest. Ultimately, the empire fell and later became part of Yuan Dynasty China, the pacified Liao. You can think of the river or think of the empire, the pacified Liao. Psst. Don't forget Ningxia, the small autonomous region tucked in under Inner Mongolia, the pacified Xia. Ningxia. We now come to the last of the 34 Chinese administrative areas, Gansu province. Like Anhui in part two and Fujian in this video, Gansu gets its name from two historically significant cities within the province, Ganzhou and Suzhou. Look at that, two more place names ending with Zhou. But wait a minute, didn't we already see a city named Suzhou in Jiangsu province in eastern China? Well, just to confuse us, there are three well-known cities with that name in China. Although they sound alike to us, their written names are different. In any case, Gan plus Su equals Gan Su. Remember Gansu. First used in ancient times, the Silk Road was a caravan route that connected China with the Western world. It passed through the important narrow Gansu Corridor, which provided a route with a string of oases between the high rugged mountains at the border between Gansu and Qinghai provinces and the deserts and mountains of Inner Mongolia. Gansu province, a rugged lifeline of trade. And there we have it, 11 more provinces and other administrative areas. Before we review, let's take a quick look at two Chinese written characters. In part two of this series, we learn the word Chuan, which is a word that means river. Then, in this video, we discussed the character Zhou which occurs in many place names. Clearly, these two characters are very similar. We discussed in part two how the vertical lines of Chuan represent the flowing water of a river. Now look at Zhou. Three small dots or dashes have been added. These represent islands or land. Flowing water is a river. The combination of flowing water and land is a territory worth mentioning. These two characters are pretty easy to remember, don't you think? Okay, ready to test yourself?
What province gets its name from a Chinese rendition of the Manchu phrase, along the river? Jilin. This autonomous area is one of the four exceptions that in English do not use the Chinese name. Informally, it is sometimes known as the roof of the world. What is its name? Tibet. This province, which faces Taiwan, derives its name from two ancient cities within. One of the cities is Fuzhou. What is the name of the province? Fujian. This special administrative region was formerly a British colony. The name we use in English is similar to the Cantonese pronunciation of a name for this area. What name do we use? Hong Kong. Genghis Khan united nomadic tribes north of China and established a massive empire. Today, a remnant within China bears the name of the empire. What is the name of this autonomous area? Inner Mongolia. The name of this self-governing island is a phonetic link to mountain people who lived on the island. What is the name of this island? Taiwan. What strangely shaped province was the historic corridor of the Silk Road? Gansu. Its urban core was formerly called Chongqing by Westerners. What is the name of this huge municipality? Chongqing. This tiny former Portuguese colony sits across the bay from Hong Kong. What is its name? Macau. Its name means precious region, and its topography has been compared to that of Switzerland. What is the name of this province? Guizhou. The name of this small autonomous area references the Western Xia Empire and its pacification. What is its name? Ningxia. Were you able to remember most of them? We have reached the end of the third and final segment of Learning Chinese Provinces. Thank you for your interest. I hope you have enjoyed the videos and learned a bit about the geography of China.